Casey Brigat from Ryan Lipinski. And the NREP program is the Neighborhood Risk Education Program that I developed uh, about 12 years ago. It's to bounce off of the CERT program, the Community Emergency Response Team programming, where uh, FEMA trains CERT teams to come in and help with disaster preparedness and emergency um, response during situations like earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, flash floods, blizzards in our case, or extreme cold, ice storms, and stuff like that, where the uh, emergency management is overwhelmed. But one of the issues here is, is that emergency management and CERD and all those agencies, they can't do everything themselves if the community doesn't do something for themselves. So if you don't prepare for, your, for events on your own, then you hinder the expedience of people being able to come help you. Because if you got a, if you got a neighborhood of a thousand people and it needs to be evacuated and people just aren't prepared or ready to do so, then before you can evacuate that neighborhood, you have to create a shelter to put them in. You have to make sure you have the supplies in that shelter ready to go for the number of people that are coming. You have to make sure you have transportation to the shelter. And you have to make sure you have first aid, uh, food, water, um, place to sleep, sanitation. All that kind of stuff has to go into play. So if you got a thousand people coming that have nothing to offer, or you know nothing, there's just themselves, then that slows the process down. But if you could speed things up by just having a little bit of knowledge of your own, how to how to maintain the utilities and stuff at your house, and um, make a go bag so you have your personal supplies, which could last you a couple of days, which helps take the strain off the emergency teams trying to get the, the stuff. Because all that stuff in the, in, the most, in the beginning gets donated by different agencies, Red Cross and, and whatnot. Salvation Army does a lot of that stuff and a lot of the churches do donate a lot of stuff. But that runs out over time and you can't always get it to everybody and you may only have enough supplies for a couple of hundred people and you got a couple thousand or so. So you never, you never know what the situation may bring, so it's always good to be prepared for yourself. So that's what this program is, to, is designed to do, is to get each individual person, their family, to be their own emergency response team. So. Uh, situations bring in bad habits, generally cause the risks. There's absolutely no reason to have all these risks going on in your house with um, all the different fire dangers and, and, and uh, ut utility. Uh, you have uh, those octopuses that are plugged into your walls where you have oh, yeah. well, an outlet that's only supposed to have 15 amps and uh, 120 volts coming out of it. But you plug like 10 plugs into it, drawing twice that much power. All of that stuff creates risks that cause all the mayhem and whatnot. But this program is to educate you on how to prevent that, those risks or reduce them and get rid of them. So you have a nice house with your bad habits. Your house can look like that. With good habits, you have no change. So that's the goal of the program. Emergency preparedness is having the knowledge of what to do and uh, how to prepare for events, how to turn the water, gas, electric, all that stuff off. Some of them to know which ones you're allowed to turn back on safely and which ones you need somebody to come out and turn back on for you. Uh, to help you get CPR first aid trained and to understand the psychological aspects of emergencies.
So hopefully today we'll get you ready and you'll know how to put together a go bag and, and how to prepare your house and whatnot so that you are ready. Uh, a disaster or emergency is anything that affects a single person, family, or an entire community. So a disaster could be your husband or spouse having a heart attack and they were the breadwinner for the home and now you don't have any money. Or it could be a car accident and now you can't get to work. Or it could be something greater like an earthquake and your whole house falls down. Or an ice storm takes out the power grid and the whole neighborhood's up. Or maybe one of these uh, kids go out in the woods over here, make a campfire, gets out of hand and the woods catch on fire and it spreads into the neighborhood. The outer edge homes around here. That's happened a few times. <laughs> yeah. so. um, emergency preparedness is having the knowledge of what to expect and how to prepare for the event. And uh, to know what types of events are you should expect or uh, prepare for in your own community. So with the utility control, uh, you should always have a fire extinguisher in areas of your home that um, are high risk. So where your your water tanks are, or in your, uh, I assume most of the homes in this neighborhood are gas heat. So in my home, down in the basement, the water heater and the gas heater are right next to each other. Yeah. So it would be a good idea. Uh, personally, I think this fire extinguisher is a little too close because if this caught on fire, you wouldn't be able to get to it. But put it on the, if you're coming downstairs to your basement, put it by the staircase door so when you come into the basement you can grab it and then you can go over to it. Because if there's a fire down there, you should know it as soon as you walk into the basement. Um, same thing with your kitchen. It should be by the kitchen door so that you can escape. A lot of people keep it under the sink, but the, if the stove is here and the sink's here, trying to get under the sink, Get the fire extinguisher for a stove, it's a little close. Uh, it doesn't have to be out in the open, but it should be somewhere where it's easily accessible and not piled up behind your coats in a closet. Yeah. So, to shut off water inside your house, there's two places in, in your home where you can shut water off from the main water coming from the, uh, the water company to your home. Outside in your yard, somewhere, either right on the edge of the road, by the sidewalk, or somewhere in your yard or in your driveway, there'll be a little plate about this big, iron plate. You just pop that off, and you have a tool. A uh, crescent wrench usually works if you get, get down on your knees and do it, or you have a long T-handle shaped pole with a little uh, hook on the end that looks like this. I tried finding one in the store, but the hardware stores around here don't sell. <laughs> so, um, you just stick it in, you turn it. There's usually arrows. It's only going to turn one direction if we're off. If it's on, it's only going to turn the other way. So, you shouldn't have to crank on it real hard. If you, if you don't know where that is, or, or you don't have time to go out and do that, if you look where your water heater is, the blue is always cold, red's always high, and nothing's going to be hot until it goes through your water heaters. You only have cold water coming into your home. So you just turn the knob there off, and the only water that will be in your home is from the outside line coming through your foundation to the inside. Everything from this point on, there will be the water coming into the home. So if you have a flood, it's only going to be the 40 or 50 gallons in your water tank. There was somebody on a community page here that said they went on a vacation, came home to find that their toilet valve had uh, failed, and their toilet had been running the entire time, flooded the bathroom, and I think they had like a $500 water bill. The water company said, well, it's not our fault because it's, with, it's a maintenance issue within your own home. Anything that happens from here, outside, water department's issue. Anything that happens from this point to the rest of your house is your issue. 
So um, it's a good idea to know how to turn the water off. Some people told me that they didn't know how to turn it off to the toilets. So if you look right behind the toilet, you got that little valve right there. Um, you can control how, how fast your toilet fills and how much water your toilet uses by that. And you can turn, the, turn it completely off, generally clockwise turns it off, counterclockwise turns it on. And same thing with the uh, valves underneath your sink. Because of the type of neighborhood we live in, um, these valve handles can look like pretty much anything because we have a lot of do-it-yourselfers around here. But normally, <laughs> you know, I clearly know what I'm talking about. <laughs> So normally you would want your hot side to be a wagon wheel style uh, handle because hot water is hot and these radiate heat from the hot water. So if you touch it, you could burn yourself or whatever. Having the wagon wheel style radiates the heat so they stay cool to the touch. Um, and they're not always going to be marked hot and cold with the red. Like underneath the sink it's usually just silver and, and the hot side would be red. But that's not always the case. So, on your water heater, it will be the case because it's code. But on your sinks and your toilets, there's no code for it you, as long as the handle works. So, um, you'll need to identify. Usually, the one on the left goes to the handle on the left, the one on the right goes to the handle on the right. Once in a while, it does. It's supposed to. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it would be a good idea to go under all your sinks and make sure you know which one is hot and which one is cold and label the hot side. Yeah, but generally, sense. turn them clockwise, turns them off, turn them counterclockwise, turns them on, opens the valve. Think of uh, righty tighty, lefty loosey. So, you're basically just screwing the cork in. Your utility boxes can be found here on, on, in our neighborhood, they're found in our basement. And in other places, they're like uh, Gwyn or whatever, they would be found in the um, garages in a lot of cases. Especially if you have an attached garage. But here on, here on Sawyer, they're going to be down in the basement. Uh, it's a good idea to keep a fire extinguisher next near it within, within a, a safe distance that is capable of, of uh, handling electrical fires because you, you don't want a water or foam for an electrical <coughs> fire. You want a powder or a CO2 or a halon. Halon's the best, but with halon you have to wear an oxygen mask and everything because halon takes away the oxygen from the room to smother the fire. CO2 pushes the oxygen out of the room to smother the fire as well. So in a household, an ABC fire extinguisher is the best because it's a powder and that helps to smother the fire, put it out, but without any real danger to the occupant. We'll go more into um, the fire suppression stuff later if we have time. So here's what your circuit breaker looks out like on the inside. You'd be amazed at how many people have never opened this door, never oh, looked I, at I it. I know what it looks like I had to, in Florida especially. Yeah. So, um, the correct order to shut them on and off, first you shut off, like if it's not an emergency. If it's an emergency, like you've got to turn it off and go and just throw the main breaker. But know that you can pop some fuses if you do. If you, have a, if you have a few moments to safely shut it off, you're going on a trip or something, then you want to shut off all of your small individual breakers first, all the 110, 120 breakers. Once you shut those off, then you shut off the 220s, like your refrigerator, your stove, if you have an electric stove, washer, dryer, all the appliances that take 220s. Then you shut off the main breaker. And make sure if you have any additional junction boxes, like a lot of the homes have the main breaker for the house and then they have a junction box for the basement or garage. You'd have to go and shut those boxes off individually. Uh, 
the, the junction boxes come off of the main, but once you turn the power off, there's a way, a proper way to turn everything back on too. And if you didn't shut those junction boxes off, you can overload the line and blow all your fuses. So make sure you just get everything turned off. Once you shut off the 110, 120 volt breakers, the single throws, just one little switch, you uh, go and hit the double throws, those are the 220s, and then you hit the main breaker, then you do your junction boxes. Once you've done that, you would go around and unplug all your heavy appliances. The, all the 220 outlets where, for your dryer, your refrigerator, stuff like that. Unplug them. This is that's the most extreme circumstance where you're going to be gone for several months. You're not storing food in your refrigerator because you properly set up your house, and uh, you don't need the heater running because it's the middle of winter. You're going on a summer vacation. You don't need the heat or air conditioner running. Or um, you know that uh, you're suspecting, like there's, if you're from Florida, they give you a three day warning that a hurricane's about to tear up your neighborhood, you know, turn them off because you don't know when you're coming back. And if your house gets torn up uh, and the utilities aren't on, you know, uh, they could ex it could explode, it could catch on fire. And it, all it has to do is have the power lines taken down next, across the street from your house, run a short through and take everything out of your house. But if you had the, everything shut off, there's no power running through your house, you know, it's just that much safer. To turn everything back on, just do it in the reverse. Uh, you're going to turn on the uh, main breaker, and then you turn on the individual breakers after that and then, and then once you've got all the breakers turned on you go in and plug in everything. So. For your gas, uh, this is what your gas main looks like outside. If you're in a duplex, it's generally uh, two of these devices. You have the main pipe come up here and then you have a, a Y and it splits off and you get one of these on each side. If you have the uh, uh, what are those? The townhouses, the long lines. You may not even see these except for on the end of the building or in the center of the of the, of the row of townhouses. In some cases. So make sure you identify which one is yours. If there's more than one, because you don't want to shop your neighbors, they might get mad. And uh, when you turn off the gas. You cannot turn the gas back on yourself. So this is in the open position. The open position means there's gas running to the house. They actually had the wrench on wrong because if you were going to turn the wrench off, if you were going to turn the gas off, the wrench would have to be down here on the bottom so you can pull up. But if they stuck it on the bottom for a picture, it would just fall off. Um, so you can see when you turn it off, you move the wrench this way, you turn it off this holes flips up like that, you can lock it in the off position, uh, the gas company can. So if the gas company came and shut off your house, they can lock it in the off position, but you can't lock it in the on position, no matter how bad Lowe's wants to tell you that they do. <laughs> the high, uh, I was at Lowe's the other, uh, yesterday, seeing if they had any non-sparking wrenches, and, so that I could show you one, and uh, they don't. The reason why I don't have these tools yet is because my home that I just moved from is 100% off grid. It's all uh, wind and solar, so and wood. So I didn't have, I don't have a need don't for, these, yeah, I don't have a need for these uh, tools uh, until I moved up here. Now I'm trying to find them and I can't find them anywhere. Uh, the gas company gave us a wrench for the church. Yeah, uh, if you go to Lowe's, they'll tell you that it's illegal to sell the wrenches. Uh, the manager did it. The, the people in the plumbing section told me this. And I was like, well, why is that? And he said, because they locked the gas lines open. I was like, I think you have that backwards. Because it's illegal to lock a gas line open. Why would they lock it open? That would be a danger. If, if it's locked open, then emergency uh, responders can't turn it off. 
uh, the fire department can't turn it off. They're not going to have a key to all the different locks in the, in the county. First responders like uh, the police, they can't turn it off. You wouldn't be, as a homeowner, be able to turn it off or anything like that. That would make no sense. The valves, do. this is what the valve looks like. It does not allow for locking in the open position. The only reason you would lock it is because once you shut the gas off, there's a very specific and procedure to turn it back on and uh, so that you don't blow the house up. Because some of the items in your house don't require a pilot and some of the items do require a pilot. And before you can turn the gas, when you turn the gas off, basically you would leave the pilots on until they burn up the existing gas that's in the line and then they will put themselves out. You do not blow the pilots out yourself. You let them burn out. The items that don't have pilots, you don't need to worry about it. It's a sealed system. And the only time that they will kick on is when, when the, um, the meter or whatever, like your hot water heater, tells it to kick on. Some of them have pilots. Mine doesn't have a pilot. It has an electric starter. So when the temperature drops and wants to kick in, the gas turns on and the electric starter makes a spark and lights it up. It goes so that way you're not burning gas all the time. But on your stove, a lot of the gas stoves have a pilot in them. And there's going to be gas in that line from there all the way back to here. And the gas is always going to flow out as long as there's something drawing it like a flame. So if you blow that, if you shut the gas off here and then you blow it out, out the pilot, there's all that free gas just floating there which will seep into your kitchen or wherever room and create a gas guide and light up a cigarette, boom, you're done. That's why you don't turn it back on by yourself because all your pilots are, are blown out. Uh, a gas technician will come into your home and they will check all your pilots and make sure that the, the valve to your device is all your devices are individually turned off and they'll check all the non-pilot devices to make sure that they're not on it at the time either. Then they will come and turn the gas back on, go back and they'll turn on the ones that don't have pilots first, then they'll turn on the ones that do have pilots individually and they'll light them right then and there so that you don't have a gas cloud forming in your house while you're running around with lighters trying to light everything. Any questions? No, I'm learning so much, it's amazing. You're, you're telling me stuff I haven't seen on anywhere else. Yeah. So, if you ever see a lock on, on the gas line, you, the only way to get that lock off is to call the gas company and they'll come take it off and, or tell you why it's on there or whatever. But there should never be one locked in the open position. That's just asking for your house to get blown up. <laughs> so, home hazard hunts. So, this is a really nice house compared to the homes we have here, although there are a lot of nice homes in our neighborhood. I like to think my house is really nice. Um, but, there are a lot of hazards that you could have just looking at the house, you think, oh, there's nothing wrong with this house. It's a great house. But there could be things like having power lines running over it. Strong wind could come by and take out a bad pole. And it wouldn't even have to be one of these two poles. It could be a pole down the road. When it falls, all these lines cause the, the domino effect. Um, some idiot could be chopping down one of these trees, have falling power lines knocking down on your house. Ice storms, especially up here in the Torres. I think uh, over what was a, a couple of weeks ago or about a month ago, over on Tarzan area, mm -hmm. the ice storm that we had caused the power lines to snap and the pole caught on fire. And like four or five homes were out of electricity for a few hours. Might have been a month and a half ago. So, but ice is uh, notorious up here for taking down your power lines. And when you got them all like this coming across your house, the power lines drop on your house, you don't want to leave the house or touch your doorknobs or anything. Um, 
use your cell phone, not your house phone. Because if the power lines fell, your house phone's probably not going to work anyway. But you don't want to go outside. It's the same concept for if the power line falls on your car. You don't get out of the car. Your house is grounded, your car is grounded. The second you open that door, you break the ground and you get electrocuted or have a risk of getting electrocuted. The rubber in your shoes is not enough rubber to stop hundreds of thousands of volts coming through those power lines. But the, the rubber in the, uh, on your tires, if you've got proper tires, not those little low profile ones <laughs> that the sports cars come with, you know, those should provide you some protection. If your electrical system in your home is grounded properly, which here on base they've actually built the houses pretty well. Mm -hmm. So everything's grounded real nice and whatnot. So as long as you stay indoors, you shouldn't have an issue with that. Here's that electrical octopus again. Um, each outlet here on in our neighborhood is 110 to 120. And they're 10 to 15 amps. You can, you can know what your outlet is by going to your circuit breaker and looking at the breakers on them. And it'll tell you if it's a 15 amp circuit or uh, a 10 amp. Uh, most houses have a, have a 15 amp circuit. And that's not just 15 amps for this one outlet. It could be, but generally it's on a circuit. And a circuit is multiple outlets. So your living room has four or five outlets and you have one circuit breaker, that means the combined total of all the outlets in your living room, because if you throw that one breaker, all, it turns off all the outlets, that one breaker has a maximum of 15 amps and a maximum of 120 volts. So if you add up the voltage of everything you plug in to all of the outlets in your living room, and add up the amperage of everything you plug in to all of the outlets in your living room. It cannot exceed 120 volts, 15 amps, or you run the risk of blowing the circuit or causing an electrical fire. You can have less, but you're not supposed to have more. How do you know how much you have? Well, you're I, I, see, I wouldn't know how to figure it out. Okay. On the because I've got my computer. Yeah. On the back of your computer, there's a tag. Usually it's imprinted in the, uh, right on the plastic, yeah. not a sticker. Uh, on your um, plugs here, this information right here. Okay. With us that wear glasses, we probably need a magnifying glass. I, I, have, I, know I, don't. I have magnifying glasses. It'll tell you what the amperage is. Okay. It, there's an incoming and outgoing. Anything that uses a block like this yeah. is converting the AC power in your house to DC power to run for your devices. All your TVs, your computers, your electric razor, your uh, electric toothbrush, anything like that, your cell phones, they all run on DC current, battery current. And any, so they're going to have a block or something like this, whether it's in the cord or in the device that converts it from AC to DC. And so on here, you're going to have how much power it puts out, and it's going to say DC, and it's going to have how much power it takes in from the wall. And that's what you want to look at, is how much power it takes in from the wall. Write that number down, the volts and the amperage. And in these, this case, it's, it's a minus... A, can't see it, but if I remember correctly from the package, it's, it's two amps for my computer. The average laptop is anywhere from two to four amps. And then if you have a desktop computer, it could be up to six to eight amps, depending on what all you have running on it. And if you're doing crypto mining, then it's an enormous amount of power. So, uh, you look under the plugs or on the back of the device. Yeah, I know where all the info is and right everything because yeah. I've had to look at all of it. Yeah, so you write the numbers down and then you, for, for the circuit, like uh, your circuit in your kitchen, uh, I have three outlets, countertop outlets, they're all in the same circuit. So everything I plug into those three outlets, I'm going to look at the device, 
add up the voltage, add up the amperage, and make sure they don't exceed 120 and uh, 15 amps. So a lot of people's refrigerators, they plug in and they keep blowing the, CF, uh, the CFI uh, plug, and it's one of two reasons. Either they have two CFI plugs on one circuit, which is wrong, or you have one CFI circuit, but you got too much stuff plugged in. The, the microwave and the refrigerator plug into the same circuit, so when you turn on the microwave, the refrigerator shuts off. So um, you're pulling too much power. So. Then, if you got kids, or if you got kids in the house, like little kids that like to climb around, you might want to consider strapping your uh, uh, bookshelves to the wall, especially in the in the garage or basement. If you're going to do that. Yeah. So, any of the liquids that are flammable and, and uh, chemical that cause burns or fires or anything like that, I suggest putting them down on the lower shelves. If they got their gas at chest height, if this bookshelf were to fall over, that gas is going everywhere. In that container or not, the, the uh, fill cap or the breathe cap can pop off if it fell and cause a problem. Uh, you want to maintain, if you've got metal uh, shelves in the garage or basement, keep a close eye on the legs so that they don't rust out on you. And you really don't want it to look like this. You want there to be a lot of breathing space for your, if you have a bunch of paint and whatnot. Try to reduce the amount of stuff you have so that you don't have big clutters and this would be very dangerous. If it were to catch up on, catch on fire, your house would be burned down in just a matter of this area in seconds, and your house in a matter of minutes. And I got a video to show you all later for just how fast the Christmas tree burns down the house. Okay. Any questions so far? So now we want to, we, we've learned how to turn the utilities off, how to turn them back on, we learned how to uh, check the house over for risks and whatnot, so hopefully we can reduce the risks in our home and not be such a, a threat on ourselves and our neighbors, because something happens to your house and immediately affects the person across the street from you, diagonally across the street from you, to your left or right and behind you. So if you think about it, it's three, six, it's eight other homes besides yours. If you live in a standard neighborhood, that's nine houses affected if the one in the middle goes. So, so what we want to do is create a family disaster plan, which would include evacuation routes out of your home, out of your block, out of your neighborhood, and out of the city and out of the state. And you need a rendezvous point for uh, a place to meet outside your home. You need a place to meet outside of the neighborhood. And a place to meet outside of the county, depending on where you are, uh, what the type of situation calls for. And you need a maintenance schedule for your vehicle, because your vehicle is what you're going to use to get away, right? You need a maintenance schedule for the utilities in your home to make sure that they don't become risks. Uh, with the, uh, the gas lines going to your home heater or your, or your uh, water heater. And you want to make sure that, you know, they're in good working order, have them checked. Uh, you want to make sure that somebody that is certified comes in and checks them at least once every couple of years at, at, the, at the most. Uh, I try to have somebody come in. And, uh, luckily for me, my wife's brother is an electrician. So it's easy for us to come in and have our breakers and stuff checked pretty regularly. And uh, being that I rent out uh, half of my uh, duplex, then it'd be smart for me to have somebody come in once a year, 
every 18 months or so and check out the gas lines and stuff just to make sure that there's no damage. So you like to think your renters are great people and taking care of the house, but you never know. You know, a dog could bump into something, carrying a box and, and trip or whatever, bump a gas line. So it's stuff you want to keep a check on, especially if you notice that your electric bill is suddenly spiking or your gas or water bill is suddenly spiking. So having a good maintenance schedule to keep an eye on that stuff can prevent all that, all those issues. And then utility control, which we already went over, knowing how to maintain your utilities, turning on and off stuff, uh, having a proper form, like a checklist, so that everybody in the household knows how to do it. And I've got a checklist if you want to make copies for anybody that wants them. So to start off, you need to know the routes to escape wherever you are. If you're at work, you want to know where the exit points are in case something happens at work. Because work isn't, no matter where you work, it still has, a, there's other people there besides you. So just about anything can happen, just like it can happen at your home. So make sure that you know the exit routes. And create a rendezvous point outside the building and uh, escape know your evacuation routes for getting home and such like that to your child's school, your relatives, wherever you need it is that you feel that you need to go to. Make sure you know how to get there from your home and from your place of business or wherever it is that you go. Here's a, a good idea to draw up a, a diagram of your house, if you can, and put that into your disaster planning model for your home. And a challenge that I'd like to have you all do when you get home with a family member, blind, blindfold yourself and start with any room that you want. But do it from all the main rooms. Do, it, do this from your bedroom, then try again from your living room, try it from your kitchen, try it from your basement. When a house goes up in smoke, you can't see anything. Whether there's a fire or not, the uh, majority of the time it's the smoke that kills you, not the, fly, not the flames. And if the power's out, you got bad eyes, maybe you can't see. And a lot of you are used to walking around your house, you know, you know where everything is. But, you know, you don't have any trouble, you don't bump into anything, and you can move around, but your eyes are open. Bird is a box. <laughs> yeah. But your eyes are open. So have somebody there with you, You're gonna blindfold yourself. Pretend that you can't see in the house because it's full of smoke or whatever. Get down on your hands and knees, because if the house is full of smoke, you don't want to be standing up, you want to crawl out of your house. So try crawling or getting down low. Whatever, whatever you're physically capable of doing, don't hurt yourself. And that's why you want somebody there with you who's not blindfolded to keep you from falling down the stairs. And then try to find your way out in the dark with your senses covered, maybe blast some music or something so that, so that you have a change, like a fire in your house burning down is gonna have that roaring sound. Maybe sirens and stuff coming around, so it's gonna be disorienting. So, when you're, if you're in a duplex, make sure you don't piss off your, your neighbor. But turn on some music, make some noise, blindfold yourself, and crawl out of the house blindfolded. Out of your seat, you can make it from your bedroom to your driveway. Or your nearest exit point. Or your nearest exit point. Um, you should always have two exits from every room. If, you're on, if you have a two stories, so there should be at least one window in every bedroom that is, um, meets the egress standards, which means it is large enough for somebody to crawl out of. And then you, every house should have two doors to get out of. Some of the houses on base, I know though, but both of the doors on the house are right next, like mine, are like, my front door's here, my garage door's here, and those are the two exit points. It kind of defeats the purpose. They should supposed to be one on each side of the house. Now, see, my exit point is one door yeah. in the new place. That's at the front. If I was couldn't get down the stairs to that door, which is next to the kitchen, I'd 
have to go out a window on the second floor. Yeah, so you would. But want yeah, to there, is, there is actually exits, but upstairs you'd have to go out. Yeah. Well, with your duplex, you know that. Um, do you have a garage that is attached? To yeah, that? and I could go out. So or I could go out to. Go out. I could go out the one window and onto the roof of the garage. It's right there. Yeah, I think it would be a good idea. You don't want to leave a, a ladder there because somebody's going to crawl, crawl out well, of yeah, so your you, house. Yeah. But get a rope ladder or, or something to that effect that you can keep either up there or inside your window so to take with you, you toss out and climb there. Yeah, I, I grew up in the city. I locked my doors. So you don't have to tie bed sheets together. Yeah, yeah exactly. Love. No, it makes sense. It, you know, it, it, it's just common sense. Yeah. And it's actually something I've never had, <laughs> is a way, a, you know, a ladder or a rope. Lowe's does sell evacuation ladders mm -hmm. and equipment to get you out of the second floor. So you can go and check them. Uh, Kitty, K-I-D-D-E. Okay. Uh, or D-D-I-E. Yeah. Uh, they have a whole, all kinds of different things. And it's not like your childhood kid's la rope ladder. Yeah, it's, it's, a, yeah, it's, it's actually su it's, uh, substantial. And they don't, they're not very expensive either. So um, that's the challenge. And hopefully you can go out and you can try it. It's a lot harder than you think. And uh, a lot of people get lost in their own homes when they're trying to do that. So. Rendezvous points should be near or far. You should have a rendezvous point in front of your house, which is like, for example, my wife and I, Ours is on the corner of the street uh, on a Strata Cruiser where the school, where you can see the school. Yeah. And then our neighbor there has a big, huge yard where we can safely stand on the yeah. corner and uh, not be in the way of traffic, be safe, and be seen. That's the key. And it's the, where the main entrance for any of our family or relatives coming in, they would be coming from that direction, they would see us. Uh, so that's the main rendezvous point. If it was in dealing with your entire block, then you want a place outside the neighborhood and uh, where you would meet. So like Adam's Place or uh, maybe the gas station in Gwen, a few miles away. Uh, if you have children that are going to the middle school or high school, they probably meet at the gas station there because that's the easiest place to get to. So, um, then you also want an out of state, because if it's a big emergency, local phone calls may not be able to get through, but long distance phone calls go on a different line. So you may be able to call out of state, but you can't call next door. So have an out of state contact as well. Uh, like Especially if you're from Florida, I'm gonna point at you a lot, because okay. Florida is constantly in the in oh, state yeah. of distress. Uh, you would want, for sure, to have an out-of-state an out-of-state contact so that say, hey, I'm coming to your place because Florida just got wiped out, or Louisiana's underwater, or in our case up here, if you have a bad ice storm, it takes out all the lines, and uh, the services are overwhelmed, you just want to head south a little bit to uh, get a place a little bit warmer where it's safer and you don't have to worry about all overstressing the needs of the emergency services when you don't need to. Some of the places to hide in your home, you never want to hide in your home if there's a fire. But in the event of an earthquake or something like that, you would want to hide like underneath the desk until the, until the shaking stops. Or in a uh, bathroom that has no exterior walls, like an internal bathroom that uh, is usually has two main walls, uh, load supporting walls in it, so it's one of the strongest places in your house. If you live on the duplexes here, the upstairs bathroom in the hallway is one of those places. So it's going to have, th those bathrooms have three supporting load bearing walls in them, so it would take a lot to take that down. Hang out in there, wait till it's safe to come out, and then evacuate. We don't really have earthquakes up here, but we do have straight line winds, which could come through and tear stuff up. With 
of those um, duplexes that have the um, bi-level um, way that they develop mm -hmm. their basement, and then they have that door, that area there would be with the concrete walls. Yeah. Uh, to be really safe. Right there, there at the staircase. That came through. Right there at the staircase going down into the basement, yes. But you wouldn't want to hang, like, with the tornado, sure. But with, like, earthquakes or a situation where the house might collapse on you, yeah. you wouldn't want to hang out in the basement because then you're going to be trapped in the underground. But unless your basement has it. I'm only talking about the, yeah, the stairway, yeah. that stairwell down there. That, yeah. that has the port walls, I yeah. think. So that should be pretty sturdy. I'm more afraid of tornadoes than anything. Yeah. And they do happen up here. Yeah. Um, and then uh, straight line winds are pretty much the same thing as a tornado, only they go in a straight line where the tornado can zigzag, go wherever they want. Uh, but they cause the same, the same kind same of damage. damage. So checklists, you want to create a, um, a checklist of who to call, what to check in your, in your home, in your vehicle, in your, your office space, uh, what to turn off, what to take with you, your list of medicines, insurance, documents. That I do have a list of. And you should have a list because I gave you one earlier. I'll give a, uh, I gave you one already. So, uh, if you look at the little flyer that I gave you, I'll give you one so you can look at two. Yeah. Uh, if you open it up and check through, it'll have a list of all the different stuff and information on there that uh, you would need. And I created this, if you want to flip through here, it's a, it's a guide that you can put all your information on it, and it has your checklist and everything else, so that you can post this somewhere in your house where everybody has access to it, and then you wouldn't have to worry about um, the rest of your family knowing what to do, or what, what needs to be done. We could have a dry run to yeah. ensure everybody. Once a season, you should do a drive. You should do a practice run in your home. One for winter, spring, summer, and fall, because each season has a different issue. And your, what you put together in winter is going to be different than what you put together in summer, because your winter you're going to need winter clothes. Summer you need summer clothes. Spring and fall is pretty much identical for the, because the, the, the weather types. You also want to learn your basic first aid. Uh, we teach the first aid class on the Saturdays before this one. And if you got pets, don't forget your animals. They need an emergency kit too. And they need all the same stuff that you need for your doctors and pharmacies and everything else. Your animals have that same, those same needs. Food, water, and everything. I do have a NOAA radio, but it has to be plugged in. But I do have a crank radio that works on batteries. I brought that, yeah, I brought that with me from Florida. And I brought the NOAA radio. Uh, Gander Outdoors sells a lot of really nice ones. Some are solar panels, powered. Some are solar powered with cranes. Some are just cranks. Some are battery. Some you plug in the wall. And then when the power goes out, they turn on. Yeah. So, and they're actually not very expensive. There's some cheaper ones at Walmart. And then you can, if you are internet savvy, you can go online and get them too. So, here's how we're going to build our kits. Uh, we have um, the home car office kits. You want to make a kit so that you have what you need because, like we talked about earlier, it could take several days before help gets to you because there's a lot of people who don't prepare and that holds up, slows down the process of people getting help. But the more 
prepared you are, the faster everybody can work and move through things to get help and rescue to you. I have a question yep. about, um, I don't know if you're coming to this, but the water of being able to have adequate water supply. And I'm wondering if, like for example, I, I buy Arizona tea in those big <laughs> containers. You need Is to, that okay to use something like that to clean it out? Yeah, um, but you need to be careful with the containers that, like, for the tea containers, the water bottle containers, because of the whole global impact of plastics, those types of containers are actually designed to break down fast. They're designed to last long enough for the use of the object, and in a little while, a little bit, maybe double the time, so that uh, if, if the object is, expires in a year, the plastic's supposed to start breaking down in like two years. Especially those little little mm -hmm. water bottles, oh, they no, break down really fast. Yeah. So um, what happens is uh, uh, they end up bursting or start biodegrading on you, and they the ones that hold consumables aren't supposed to leak chemicals or anything into your water. But once they start biodegrading, you know stuff happens, and there's and, and your water might not be there when you need it. I, I heard stories of preppers who were storing the big cases of water down in her basement, and they was down there for two years, three years, oh, and never checked on it, and then one day they went down there and the whole basement was flooded, because they all burst, <laughs> because of, they expired. So, uh, if you do use those types of containers, get the thick, heavy-duty ones, like the orange juice containers, the, the tea containers, and keep a check on them one, at least every three to four months, I would say check on them every three months. Just make sure you don't have algae growing in them. Maybe keep them in a cool, dark place. And uh, make sure that they're not breaking down on you. And out of sunlight, because heat and sunlight is what causes the biodegradation of the plastics. And so the like leaching the sun of tea, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the, like the sun tea uh, glass, sun tea. The, the glass ones? Yeah. They, those, those will last for a while, but then you're talking about glass. And, you're, and if you had to evacuate or whatever emergency situation, right. you've got a glass container, they shatter. So a good heavy, heavy duty plastic container. The best idea is to get a six gallon water jug or a jug the size that, you can, that you're physically capable of carrying. Walmart sells the six dollar water jugs for thirteen dollars. And they're real nice and they're meant to last. You put the water in there, they're UV blocked so that the sunlight and stuff isn't going to damage them. Put them in your closet, forget about it until you need the water. And just check on it every now and then, make sure a mouse or something didn't chew a hole in it. I've actually had mice chew holes in my gas cans of all things. Oh my gosh. So they're down there getting high, huffing on my gas. <laughs> I'm like, what's wrong with you guys? Got a little stoner mouse or whatever. I've never heard of that. Well, that's, that's another question, you know, like, uh, how can people keep extra gas on hand in the event of something? Because you see the, the gas lines and, you know, the difficulty of getting well, the enough best, gas to get The best way away. to do that is to make sure that never let your gas tank drop below a half a tank. Right. And the average gas tank is anywhere from 15 to 20 gallons. Um, so even my truck, my truck is a 20 gallon tank, even though it's a big truck. So you don't want to put five or four or five gallon jugs of fuel in your garage. But if you keep your, if you keep your car, never let your car drop below a half a tank. The average car can do 400 miles these days. So that's a half a tank is going to get you 200 miles. That should be more than enough to get you to safety, to where you should be able to find gas. And then if you keep one five gallon of gas, and that gives you three fourths of a tank, and that or in a car is going to it's going to top your tank off. That gives you your 400 miles right there, 300 to 400 miles on a full tank. So you should be able to get to safety there. Uh, for storage of it, 
depending on the type of fuel you buy, there's storage packets that you can, little gel packets or whatever that you can add, additives that you put in the fuel and you, you, you put up on storage. I've stored gas at my off-grid homestead in Pennsylvania. I've had ga a five gallon gas can stored for two years and I just drop in one of those packets and it still works good fine. You don't want to do it all the time because it's hard in your vehicle, but uh, if you get a, get a gas can stored through the winter, make sure you use it in the spring and replace it. You know, so every, every three or four months, just take that gas can, pour it in your car or your lawnmower or whatever, and then go fill it up and just cycle it out. That's the best way to do it. You know, don't let it sit for more than six months at a time. Because people forget if the power goes down, you can't get gasoline. That's right. And you also have to have cash because you can't. There's you a electric pump that pump it, and there's uh, the machines need the electricity to run your cars. Yeah. Uh, some some of the gas stations, if they're prepared, have uh, generators to power them. But I don't know of any of the gas stations. I don't think the corner, the uh, four corners crossroads. I don't think they have a generator system. And I know the one here, here in Gwynn, I know they don't, unless they got one while I was gone. I call it Four Corners, too, and my daughter doesn't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but for some reason, it's Four Corners for me. Yeah, that's, it's always been Four Corners for me. My wife calls it Crossroads, and then we butt heads. Like, no, I mean, it's talking Four about? Corners. I, yeah. I found somebody else who does it. I don't feel alone anymore. I think the uh, <laughs> Four Corners was the old version. Of the name, of the name. I had four corners someplace I lived. When they built else. the restaurant, they started calling it Crossroads. Oh, okay. So that's my understanding. <laughs> so, okay, so your home kit. Uh, the most important item for me in a home kit is the activity item. Because all this other stuff is should be common knowledge, and you know, what are you going to need? But everybody forgets. Now, I've, I've done disaster services with Red Cross and with FEMA, been all kinds of emergencies. Uh, 2005, the seven hurricanes came yeah. through. I was in all seven of them down there responding with FEMA and Red Cross and setting up shelters. And the one thing that caused 90% of the issue, people get to a shelter or to the evacuation plan point, and they have nothing to do. Yeah. And I'm like, didn't you pack a crossword puzzle or a book? Some coloring books. I saw you got these coloring books for the children. You know? So they have something to do while they're in there for two, three, four days, Hurricane Katrina months. You know, you need something to do. So, but aside from that, you need clothing that matches the season. So every season, change out your clothing. First aid kits, like we talked about in the first aid kit of class last week, you're, you shouldn't buy pre-manufactured first aid kits. And the reason for that is you should, you should, your first aid kit should only include stuff that you have been trained to use and that you personally know how to use. If you don't know how to use it, it shouldn't be in your first aid kit because you're going to get yourself in trouble. And then once you start doing stuff that you don't know how to do, then the Good Samaritan laws no longer protect you. So make your own first aid kit with the stuff that you know how to use and that you've been trained on. Just because you know how to do a tracheotomy doesn't mean you can do one. So, uh, phone. Um, this neighborhood, I know they have all the phone jacks in the wall where you just plug them in, but we've all switched over to cable or DSL or whatever, so you have to have a modem to make your phone work. So I used to teach people to make sure you had a corded phone in your house because the kind that you plug into the, into the regular standard phone jack in the wall draws its power from the phone company. So if the power goes out in your house, your phone's still going to work. But in our neighborhood, that's not so much the case anymore. Places down in Marquette or uh, out in Gwynn, maybe so. But I don't think the, the phone lines... The norm, I don't think there's a normal phone line service here in, in our neighborhood anymore, to my knowledge. So make sure you have your phone, your, if you have a cell phone, make sure you have a charger to go with it. You could even consider spending 20 bucks getting a uh, track phone. 
and another ten dollars to get a portable battery pack. Charge them both up and then put them in into your kit. And the track phone, as long as you check it, um, like you get a, a minute card for a year, just check it once a year, make a phone call once a year. The phone never dies. I have a, I have a solar charger for my phone. A little thing. Uh, a little pro tip for solar charging devices. Make sure you turn the device off before plugging it into a solar panel. Because if the device is on, chances are it will drain power faster than the solar panel can charge it, especially up here in Michigan. Uh, when I was out in the desert and it was bright, hot, sunny days, it, uh, I still had trouble charging the phone while it's turned on. You need to turn the phone off to charge it off of solar chargers or crank chargers. Turn the phone off, use your crank charger or your shake charger. If you got Parkinson's like I do and you shake all the time, shake chargers are nice. You just hold it in your right hand and I shake it all day long and don't have to worry about getting tired because my body's going to shake anyway. You know? But for those of you that don't have Parkinson's, get a crank one or a solar one, turn the device off and charge it faster. So, you want a list of addresses and phone numbers and emergency contacts one for the neighbor across the street, make a pact with the, one of your neighbors that lives on your street. Because if you're not home and they see your house burning down, they can call you, or vice versa. Uh, or if you need, there's an emergency situation and you need to be like, you back over to their house while the fire department's putting the fire out or something. You need uh, somebody else uh, outside the neighborhood, like maybe Gwen or Marquette, and you need somebody outside the state. Then you need your doctors, your vet for your animals, all those, all those people you want their names, address, con contact information. And it's just as simple as just getting a piece of paper and handwriting it all down. Or if you really want to get fancy, get on the computer and use Excel and make graphs and everything else like I did with the handouts there. You can even go online and they have printouts where somebody's already done it all for you, all you have to do is just fill in the information. A copy of your disaster emergency plan, which we talked about earlier, your escape routes and everything, maps. Make sure you have a map of your neighborhood and stuff. Because <coughs> how many people explore the neighborhood or do you just take the same route to and from wherever it is you go all the time? You know, my wife and I, we try to take different routes whenever we can and have the time. We take a different route to explore the routes so that we know different ways to come in and out. And, uh, especially when you have a neighborhood that only has two exits. You need to know routes through the neighborhood to get to those different exits in case they get overwhelmed. Cash money, not credit cards. And I'm not talking thousands of dollars, just what you can afford to set aside for an emergency. Yeah, they recommended in Florida if you could have 100 or 2 on hand. Yeah. But if you've only got 50, at least you've got cash. Even $20. Even the $20 bill is yeah. better than no cash. And if, you're, if you can't handle that, a dollar a dollar a month, or I got a dollar out of every paycheck, just tuck it into, into your emergency kit. Eventually, after a while, it you know, adds up. Yeah, if you have to get out, at least you've got gas money. How long, I mean, how often does an emergency happen? So if you do a dollar out of every paycheck, three years down the line, that's $36. Yeah, so. enough for gas. Yep. Car kits, pretty much the same, but you want to make sure that you have a spare tire and the tools to change it, the knowledge of how to change it, <laughs> the knowledge of how to check your fluids, and uh, your radiator fluids, your your windshield wiper fluids, and, a, and in a storm, you need your windshield wipers. So you need to know how to change the fluids and stuff. I mean, in the snowstorm here, you've got to have that fluid in there. You run out of fluid, you're, you're, you're done. You've got to pull over as soon as your windshield gets dirty. Uh, you don't necessarily need a CB radio, but a cell phone would be great that works in your area. Tow rope or tow chain. If you have a car, know where the hookups are for the tow ropes and tow chains so that somebody with a truck who has that stuff can hook, it, hook you up. 
I pull people out of the ditches all the time, and I have yet, out of the this winter alone, the five people I pulled out so far, not a single one of them knew where to hook their vehicle up. I wouldn't know. I have no idea. So uh, we will. I'm working on getting a class, uh, a weekend class, to where we're going to have my truck and, and my car out there. My wife has a car, and we're going to bring the truck in the car, and we'll show you. An example with the truck for those who own pickups, an example with the car, how to change the tire and how to check your fluids and do all the maintenance stuff. We're not going to teach you how to um, do a tune-up or anything, just how to check your, your fluid just levels. Just the basics. Just the basics, exactly. So that you are prepared for an emergency situation and you don't get caught on the side of the road trying to evacuate. No, oh, just because it's, I'm thinking of it right now, you've got water and food, can opener. Yes. And can opener, because most people, you'll grab stuff and you'll forget a can opener. It's got to get franked and can opener. And the one with canned foods, try to stay away from pop tops. Because when they start to expire, they build up the gas and then they explode and they ruin everything in your, own, in your mess kit. Just like we were talking about with the water bottles when they age and they biodegrade, pop tops do the same thing. And also, if you drop them or they get squashed or dented, they pop. So make sure that you use non-pop top uh, food containers, like uh, cans, and have a, a can opener that you are comfortable with. And I use a P90 from the Army days, just a little tiny little thing, although with Parkinson's I'm going to have to get something better. I use a swing away. Yeah. I got swing aways. Every time I buy one, I buy a swing away. They're they were the best for me. My wife likes using the, uh, the side cutters so that they don't create sharp edges, which is great if you have pets and you've got canned, canned dog food or whatever, and then you need a, uh, you forget a bowl or something happens, you don't have a bowl, you use the side cutter to cut the lid off so there's no sharp edges, and then you feed them out of the container. Talking about pets, because I want to bring this up. I do have a slide for the pets too. The artificial sweetener, they put gum and candy and stuff, it's, yeah, it's, it's bad can kill it. animals. Yeah. Um, my brother-in-law, my son-in-law's brother, one of his dogs died from eating that stuff. Got a Xylophone. Yes. Yeah, it will kill dogs. Mm -hmm. And now we know a couple of people who their dogs have died from that. Yeah. Most people don't know that. I didn't until the last couple of months. Luckily, my wife is a zoologist. So she would know. And we're, we will, later this summer, we're working on a, a, another course where animal safety. That'd be wonderful. And uh, so we will be presenting something along those lines this, this summer. What foods to stay away from for cats and dogs and uh, other household pets. What plants to keep away from. And basically making a, a disaster risk-free home for your animals. And my, my wife will be presenting on that sometime later this year. Isn't beef and baki one of the things that will kill them? I, yep. you'd have to ask my wife. That's one of them, isn't it? Yeah, I just thought of that just now. So with the vehicle, you want to make sure you have maps of the area. You, you want to make sure that you have some kind of, those triangle reflectors are great because they're reusable. Once you have them, you don't have to replace them unless somebody runs them over and destroys them. Flares are one-time use and they don't always work, especially if you, they get old or wet or forgotten about. So I suggest the triangles. They're actually getting really nice nowadays and really cheap. Um, have a backpack, you can put it all in and store it in your trunk. And it really doesn't take up very much space at all. About the size of a backpack that you would need to put my coat in is you know, crunched up. That's about the size you would need there. The important thing is that the car breaks down. Stay inside the car and call someone. Yeah. Get off the road yeah. because there were uh, two people that were killed, and they they left the vehicle and then they were struck and killed. Yeah. So uh, this past week. If it's winter time, make sure you have a blanket or a sleeping bag to keep yourself warm. Even though you're in a vehicle, you've got gas, leaving the engine running. Uh, you can have this, with up here there's a lot of rusty vehicles, so sitting on the side of the road with the engine running could lead to a, 
a uh, carbon monoxide leak into the vehicle. Down in Pennsylvania, uh, they check for that and we have uh, mandatory um, inspections, yeah. which I kind of wish they had up here. Massachusetts does too. Yeah, I wish they would do that here in Michigan and get a lot of these dangerous vehicles off the road. But um, you should take your vehicle in and get it inspected and stuff because you have a carbon monoxide leak in your vehicle and you're stranded on the side of the road, flat tires or whatever, especially in winter, you got to leave the engine running to keep you warm, and you end up falling asleep and suffocating to death. Carbon monoxide poisoning is some of the signs of one of the uh, late or mid signs is you start to turn pale, like pink, and then the late signs you start turning blue, and then by then you're dead. So. I have a question. Would the uh, carbon monoxide um, home thing be a good thing to have in your car? I do believe they make them for your vehicles too. So if they don't, you just put one in your vehicle for the home. I mean, it's going to do the same thing, do a detection. So if you did have to, say, pull over on the side of the road and wait out a blizzard or, or wait for emergency help and leave the engine running, you could pull it out and turn it on. The other thing I would say is that with the map that you have, if you're in a familiar area, um, that you keep track of where you do not have cell phone yeah. service. And I do, I do mark uh, on the map where people are service thinking ranges. that they always have it. They don't. Like those ladies that were missing for several days. Mark out where the gas stations are on your map. <laughs> And if you don't know how to read the map, find somebody that does to explain how to read your particular map. Like, don't go and say, I need somebody to teach me how to read the map, and they go and just grab some Joe Blow map and show you. Take your map, the one that, that you're going to use in your vehicle, and set it down in front of them and say, show me how to read this map. Because it's that map that you need to learn. And maps are different from one map to another. They're not all created equally. So. are really like life skills and so, people haven't been taught life skills. Yeah, well hopefully we can get one, my goal is to get one person on every street in our neighborhood trained in this stuff. So we have office and school kids, uh, pretty much the same thing, it's just broken down with, with office and school the idea is to get home. And with the home kit, the idea is to get to an evacuation point or a shelter. The car kit is the idea is to get from the uh, home to an evacuation route or from your school or office to your home. So with the office and school kids, you need uh, a little bit of water, flashlight, uh, NOAA radio, batteries to replace that stuff, a whistle, and your emergency list of phone numbers and addresses and the disaster plan for the house that, or for the school or place where you, you, you work at. And then a copy of your family disaster plan. And luckily, all of this stuff is paperwork. So you just get it laminated or put it in a plastic sleeve or get clear package tape and put it over it, which is a poor man's laminating. It all works just as good. With the pet supply kit, you gotta remember your pets need three days worth of food and water just like you do. And you need a dish, a bottle, a leash, harness, and a collar. And for an emergency situation, you might want to, for a dog, consider having a harness rather than just a collar, a collar for your leash. So you have better control of the animal because there's gonna be lots of animals around. And even though your dog may be the best dog in the world, the most well-trained dog in the world, that person's dog may not be, so you'll need control. Um, it'd be a good idea, like this is my dog when he was a puppy, have him carry his own bag. Put, make, when you make his um, emergency preparedness kit, make it in a, in, a, in a doggy backpack that they can carry so you don't have to carry it. And, a lot of them now are designed to be a harness with packs on them. 
So you kill two birds with one stone there. And a dog should be able to carry everything that he needs, with the exception of, like he should be able to carry a day's worth of food and water, and then you can, that you can keep the other two days of food and water with your kid. So the person has a little chihuahua. I was just going to say that. I was laughing. Really thinking, thinking. Yeah. A little chihuahua. Um, if you have a little football dog, then you know, you're going to have you You made the choice to care for that animal. So. Oh, you may need a baby carrier to carry yeah. the dog around you like you carry a baby. Yeah. So you if know. you want to keep a shot records, rabies tags, microchip number, uh, medical forms and current photo. And uh, the microchip number is really important. My dog has a microchip, he has a dog tag, and he has a tattoo. So if he gets loose, three ways to identify him. He can't be stolen. Well, he can be stolen, but he can be identified if someone who did steal him. And uh, the microchips, there's a couple of different versions of microchip guns, but they uh, most places that use the readers um, usually have the ability to read the different versions. And there's uh, places that you can, um, there's online services that you can pay for, and there's some free ones where you can register your dog's microchip number. So if he gets loose and gets caught by somebody, they scan it, they, they do a check, your name, address, and everything pops up. What kind of dog is he? He's an Australian cattle dog with a little about 10% pit bull mix. It's beautiful. Yeah. He's just about a year old in that picture. What's his name? Kyle. He thinks he's God. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we think he does have magical powers because he's got to have thumbs because he opens doors and does stuff. Oh, yeah, I believe it. And, uh, and he definitely has a toolkit somewhere in his fur. Yeah, they can do more the things than people realize. So in review, knowing what to expect, have the proper supplies in your emergency kit, keeping track of expiration dates is a big thing. It should probably be at the top of the list. Keep in mind the number of people the kit is for. So you're not just making a kit for you, you're making one for everybody in your house. And so each person in your house gets a backpack. Or um, work on getting towards that, whatever you can afford. And uh, don't forget the pets. So. Have you ever seen the flashlights that work with water? No. You haven't seen those yet? I think they've had them on QVC or HSN. Hmm. It's a cylinder light, and you immerse it in water. And then you put it in this flashlight, and it actually, you shake it, and it will light. Hmm. I haven't seen that yet. Yeah, it's, they're not expensive. I was almost tempted to send for one, just to see how good they really are. I like the, uh, not the cheap generic ones that you get from the dollar store, or the cheap ones you get from Walmart, but the good quality cellular lights, the kind lights where you snap them, Give them a shake and a glow for like 12 hours. I haven't seen those. The, the good ones um, actually work really nice. The ones you get from the dollar store work for a couple hours and they're kaput. Um, I never thought of getting any of the other ones. They'd be nice for the house if the bar goes out. I've got a couple of uh, those smaller tack lights. I really like those. Yeah, I, what, uh, I, what I use is battery operated motion sensor uh, lights in my home. Yeah. So if the power goes out, I yeah. can still see down my hall, yeah. I can see my back. We have uh, I, at uh, Menard, I bought these little, little tin uh, LED uh, lights that have a sticky back. Mm -hmm. So I have that in my kitchen. And uh, it's really helpful to have those kinds of things and not be dependent. Um, I should actually get a couple of those. And so then place. I have solar powered lights outside and, and Home Depot has a rope light that's solar powered. And, uh, we have uh, the solar powered light 
lights that we put in the window sills. So when the sun's up, it charges the lights, and then motion sensor. They have they you can set them so that when the sun goes down, they automatically turn on, yeah. or they turn on with motion sensor, one or the other, or both. And so we set them on to turn on with motion sensor only, so they charge, and then when uh, you walk into the room, the light comes on, and then you can turn on the regular light if you need to. And uh, uh, if you really want to go all out, you can just, you can go with a, a massive uh, solar power system like I have in my home. I have 600 watts of solar, 400 amp hour battery bank, and the um, controllers and everything to do it. So the power goes out up here in the winter time. It's not going to do much uh, because there's my my system's not one of the new newer versions, and there's not a whole lot of sun up here. But in the summertime, spring, summer, or fall, it would be enough power to supply the lights to my home or to keep certain functions that I need. It would, like, it's not enough to run the entire house, but it is enough to keep, you know, I could pick and choose what functions I wanted to run. And uh, so that system costs about two or three thousand dollars. So you can start out with just a, a few dollars with a solar light or you can go all the way up to the system I have. Or you can buy a generator. And if you buy a generator, I would suggest going with a propane generator because you don't have to worry about gas or diesel going back. Yeah. And if you're going to do a generator setup, make sure that you have an electrician install it. There's a, there's a um, generator connection that you can have installed to your circuit breaker with a throw switch. So when the power goes out, you flip it from the on-grid power to your generator power, and when it comes back on, turn the generator off and then flip it back. But an electrician needs to install that so that it only what powers I, what the generator can run. What I've done to prepare for power outage is what I just mentioned, and in addition, I bought and had the uh, blue flame heater that goes on the wall, and it's a mechanical start. And so I don't have to have electricity to uh, have heat in my home. So I will have heat and I will have light. Uh, and I, I have the ability to charge my phone. And so, uh, you know, I, I've tried to be prepared because I, I was trained at Red Cross in the past. And so I always look for these things. And so like the solar lights that I have outside, even though it's winter time now, they still work. So I have it uh, over my garage door. So when I pull up, it's on, my, on the side of the garage as I go back to the house. And I have one installed on the back of my house. And they're not all, they're not huge, bright, but they are um, limited in the amount of light they put out. But they're motion censored, so when somebody would walk by them, the light gets really bright. Even in the winter now, I don't have a problem. Well, that's now. great. And I bought these on Amazon.com. So we're going to move on to fire suppression, and I have a quick video I'm going to show you because since it's Christmas time, probably people still up with their Christmas trees up. Mine is still up. It's a fake one, but it's still up. Um, so I'm going to show you a Christmas tree fire. It could be started from a smoker. It could be started from um, a Christmas lights going bad, short circuit. That electrical octopus we showed you before. It's really big at Christmas time, people plugging too many things into the outlet. So, there's a number of reasons uh, that this could happen. That poor bunny is going to get me his match. So, let's see. You see the little spark yeah. there. And there's a little timer down here. Wow. You were at 15 that seconds. That is fast. Yeah. 10 seconds there. Wow. 
At this point, at, at within five seconds, it's too late to use a fire extinguisher. The only thing you can do is just get out of the house. At this point, there's nothing you as a homeowner can do to save anything. 30 seconds, the whole house is in flame, engulfed, and wow. we're done. I was that with a tree? Yeah. That was the Christmas tree. Oh, yeah. Poor I watched Bunny a movie gone. some years ago about a fire inspector. And <clears throat> now here's another one where they're going to, um, they're setting up, this is a, a lot of smokers, you're, you're smoking and you yeah. drop a cherry down in the, into the couch or something. It takes a little bit longer, but this could be burning for a while and you not even know it. And then it'll smolder for a while, and then when it flares up, well, you basically see it here in the video. This happens within about three minutes or so. At this point, you could still put it out with a fire extinguisher. I wanted to mention that at Menard, they had small fire extinguishers, um, and they were like less than nine dollars. Yeah, the, little, the little can ones, it's like the aerosol can. can. Those are good for your backpacks. Or... Yeah. Put those in your backpack or something. If you're going to get a car one, you want to get the white one, which is similar to this. Uh, and if you're going to get uh, for your car or garage, if you're going to get one for your house, try to get an ABC one. Uh, those little, I have one of those uh, little aerosol ones like you mentioned, which is great to put tossing your in your bug out bag or your uh, disaster kit. But they're only good for um, that can would not put out something like this. Right, no. It's just good for like a, a quick small. little a small fire, house fire or camp stove fire or something like that. I have a fire extinguisher. It's about this tall and it's heavy. Yeah. But it'll take care of it. When this is done, uh, we'll go over the different types of fire extinguishers, and I'm going to show you how to use one. We're not going to actually put out a fire right now, but I'm working on getting the fire department to come out, and actually we'll start a fire out in the parking lot and, and uh, see if, if I can get a hold of some fire extinguishers and actually put a fire out and give you all a chance to see how the how it's done in live There, action. it's just two minutes. Yeah, now it's too late for you to do anything. Yeah. Get in, a, in a second, it's going to flash over. And you get what's called a flash over, and uh, the whole room goes up at once. The movie I watched was, I'm going to find out where it is, I've got to get online. It was the best movie about fire I've ever seen. But this guy said that a fire has a life of its own. Well, it breathes, it eats, yes. it gives birth to other flames. Exactly. And it was really impressive the way he talked about fire. See this big, thick, heavy smoke here? This big, thick, heavy smoke is throughout the entire house now. If the doors are open, it's throughout the entire house. So if you were asleep, you're breathing in that smoke. The heat you may not feel, it just flashed over to the rest of the room. The heat, if you're in your bedroom, you're probably not even going to feel that, but the smoke is going to kill you before that fire ever gets to you. We're three minutes in and then the fire. Yeah, so within We'd three be very minutes, lucky to have the fire department show up in three minutes. That is really... Uh, even in so, the city, sometimes it can take longer. There it is coming down. Three and so a half why, hours. why it's important to have the smoke detectors uh, checked every month? Always check them the first of the month. So here we are with uh, fire suppression. The who, what, where, and what to do. Your Classes of fires, A is your trap, papers, wood, stuff that you can put out with water. Uh, flammable liquids, gasoline, alcohols, oils, those, uh, if you try to put them out with water, it just spreads the fire out. If you ever toss water on a stove fire, 
and you learn really fast not to do that again. And you don't use flour either because the tossing flour on a fire, if you ever had a, when you open up your flour and you mess with the flour, you get that little cloud of white yeah. cloud in the area. That's extremely explosive. Oh. Flour, if you can poof a, a handful of flour up in the air and you take a match and light it, which I don't suggest you do, it goes boom, it explodes. So don't use flour for that either. Uh, electrical equipment, can't use water on. Uh, you want to use something like halon or CO2 if you have an oxygen uh, breather mask or you use a powder like this can down here. And combustible metals, which you shouldn't be dealing with in your home, if you are, why? What are combustible metals? Magnesium. Okay. Math. <laughs> Back labs. <laughs> okay. But they are the same. They give fires from meth. So oh, yeah. yeah. Meth, meth labs are really bad. They like to blow up. That magnesium is one of the, there's a good uh, okay. calcium and some others. So you have electrical hazards, gas hazards, and flammable combustible liquids are the three major issues that a household has. Um, you want to locate the potential source of ignition and do what you can to reduce or limit them. You don't want to have just stockpiles of, of crap sitting there that could burn your house down. And try to keep it in the garage or an outside storage facility rather than in your basement. Uh, fire in your basement is really bad because your whole house is gone then. Fire on the second floor not so bad because the heat rises. It takes longer to burn down than it does to burn up. So, so use of electrical um, extension cords. Uh, that is a real dangerous yeah. thing Which to is, over use the yeah, uh, like we were talking about uh, earlier before you arrived, oh. um, you have circuits, and on your your circuit isn't just one outlet; it's all the outlets that connect to that one fuse. Together. So when you have a circuit breaker, you have a, you have a fuse or a switch that goes to all the uh, like uh, a lot of the homes here. Uh, all the outlets in your living room are all in one circuit. So all the outlets in your living room, everything you plug into your living room, no matter what outlet it is, if it's on the same circuit, cannot exceed 15 amps and 120 volts, or whatever the rating is for that circuit. And uh, you don't want to run extension cords underneath carpets, or even above the carpets where they're going to be tripped on. You want to inspect all your cords and stuff to make sure that there's no frays or, or cuts or you know, mouse chews or dog chews or cat chews on them and uh, replace anything that is broken or get rid of it and maintain all the appliances whenever you can. Well, you should maintain them whether you can or not. If you can't maintain them, you should get rid of them because you don't want your house burned out. Read the labels on all your flammable liquids. Uh, you, there's certain types, I'm not a chemist, but there are certain types of liquids that you put this liquid with this liquid, put them together, and it can bust into flames. Calcium and, and uh, water, I think, is one. And then uh, there's uh, white phosphorus, it's another one. You don't want to mix those with water or whatever. So uh, you want to read the labels on the, on the liquids that you have, and they will tell you what you can. can put it with and what you can't put it with, or how you need to separate it. All the information should be on there. And if, it, if you can't find the information that you're looking for, you can go online and look up the MSDS manuals for it, which is the Material Safety Data Sheets, and they'll give you all the information you need to know uh, about it. Just type in, just Google MSDS, and then the, the, the chemical or liquid that you're looking for. You use the lies. LIES for storage procedure to limit, isolate, eliminate, and separate. And for the different types of fires, for the trash fire or wood, you use water, foam, or dry chemicals. For the class B fires for flammable liquids, foam, CO2, or dry chemical, or halon. You notice that there, other than the special agents, everything can use dry chemicals to put out. So, the standard household uh, 
fire extinguisher would be the red ABC fire extinguishers. You can get the white ones that are specific for your kitchen or specific for your car or specific for your garage. But in your house, you're going to have one of these three issues. You shouldn't have special agents unless you're like a meth lab or something. But uh, if you get an ABC fire extinguisher and put one in all the places in your home, then no matter where in the home there's an issue, you may not be able to get into your basement to the fire extinguisher to put out the, the fire from your hot water heater. But you can get to the one that's in the kitchen to use in the basement, or get to the one that's in the basement to use in the bedroom, or something like that. So if they're, if they're all ABC fire extinguishers, then you shouldn't have an issue. If you have a special cause for one, then get a fire extinguisher that's for that special cause, if you have that issue. Um, the only times you want to use an extinguisher is if you have an escape route and make sure that the extinguisher is large enough to handle the situation that you have. Generally speaking, a fire extinguisher is just to get you out of the house. It's not to put fires out. It's to make sure that you have the ability to get from your bedroom to your front door or to your window or to, to get through your escape route not to fight fires. Um, if you have just a little trash can fire or something small, you can go put it out before it comes to an issue. But if, you, if it's to the point where you have to escape your home, which we saw is just a matter of seconds in that video, if it's to the point where you have to escape your home, the fire extinguisher is just used is just to get you out of the house, not to fight the fire. Make sure you have the right type of extinguisher, make sure it's large enough, make sure the area is free of dangers, there's nothing to fall on you, it's structurally sound at this point, and there's nothing that's going to be explosive or uh, going to harm you or anything. And make sure that somebody knows, like, like if you are in there fighting the fire with the fire extinguisher, make sure that somebody knows that you're in there doing so, that's not in there with you. So if something happens, there's somebody outside to tell the fire chief that you're in there. So you have the anatomy of the fire extinguisher. You have your pull pin here. So you're going to pull this out. Sometimes it's these little plastic rings. Sometimes it's a metal ring that you pull out. But it should be quite obvious. You yank the ring out, kind of like a grenade. You yank the ring and throw the ring. Unlike a grenade where you yank the ring and you throw the grenade. <laughs> in this case, you're going you're to yank the ring and throw the ring. Because we shouldn't have to be playing with grenades. So, I've gotten to throw a lot of grenades in the army. It's quite fun, but you don't want to throw your fire extinguisher. Throwing your fire extinguisher into the fire, and like they do on TV, and then shooting it, doesn't make it explode. <laughs> This one here is packed with the chemical powder to about here. And right here, when I pull this trigger, there's a CO2 cartridge in here that will explode and compress the canister and break up the powder and make, a, and make a, um, like a cloud inside there. So when I pull this trigger and I start to spray, it, it'll come out. And then after a few minutes, the pressure is gone and it's just a one-time use. You can't just use it and say, oh, I only used half of it, and then expect next time to open it up because you've already exploded the, um, the CO2 cartridge. So even though it's still under pressurization, it's the explosion effect that breaks up the powder and makes it still usable. Yeah, well, it makes it usable. So if you set it off to the side and let it sit for a while, that powder settles back down like the dust, and then all you're doing is just releasing the CO2 out of it. So. You have either a handle like this, where you, if this ring was pulled, you push it down with your thumb, or you have the one that squeezes this way, or you can have the one over here which you have a big nozzle on. But they all work the same. You pull the pin, you squeeze the handle. This is the best style here because there's less moving parts, less working parts. You just pull this, and the only moving part is this part right here, and you press it down and squeeze it. You have the directions here, and then you have what it can use here, the ABC.
and of course the cylinder. And my wife likes to ride all over it. Do not hide, cover, bury, tuck away access or make difficult. <laughs> Um, you have a gauge on here that says, that'll tell you when it's empty, which if you're spraying it, you should, you know, get a good idea when it's empty. At the tip of the, the needle should be in the green as long as it's good and functional, but there's also a date on here. Um, I found it before, but I don't remember where the date is. Somewhere on, on here there is a date and you should get them, you should have them checked out um, periodically. There's, there's an inspection date on them. So if you can shake it up and you hear the powder moving around, probably a good sign that it's still good. And you haven't popped the CO2 cartridge inside, should be good. And if your needle's in the green, it should still be good. But you should have it tested and checked by a fire department. You can take any of your fire extinguishers to your local firehouse and like give them a call, ask them when, when to bring them down. Sometimes you can just bring them down whenever you want. Sometimes they have a special day of the month or whatever to bring them down. But just give them a call and say, hey, can I bring my fire extinguishers down to you to check for my home? And they'll be more than happy to do so. In fact, they'll be very happy to do so. They might even send somebody out to your house to do it because They'd rather have you check it than to have to come rescue you. And I've never had anybody say that before either. What's that? That you can get to fire extinguishers checked at the fire department. Oh, yeah, you can. I used to take mine down there. When I used to live up here before, I'd take mine down there about once a year. I, I took them with uh, 15 fire extinguishers once. Because I, I gathered up everybody's fire extinguishers on the street. I took them down there. <laughs> <laughs> and had them all checked. That was great. I just walked right into the, I just walked right into the I didn't even call first. I just walked in and said, hey, can you check my fire extinguishers? And they're like, sure. And, and they were like, where are they at? And the back of my truck goes back. <laughs> How big is your house? <laughs> yeah. No, he probably looked at the thought, oh my gosh. I told him I brought all my neighbors. He's got a 15 or 20 room house. What a great room. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, that was when That's I was. I that's when I was teaching the community emergency response okay. teams for FEMA. So I had everybody in the FEMA class oh, bring okay. the fire extinguishers in Great idea. one time, and then another time I took everybody on the streets in. So, um, what you need to remember is pull, aim, squeeze, and sweep. So pull, aim, squeeze, and sweep back and forth. Not up and down. Unless you're going on the like the frame of your doorway. Yeah. Like if the fire is on the frame of your doorway yeah. here, just spray from the top, from the bottom going up. Oh. Uh, don't spray from the top going down, because flames rise, heat rises, so yeah. you're just gonna keep setting it back on fire. Start at the bottom, take the fire out on the bottom, work your way up the door so that the fire doesn't continue climbing up the door while you're trying to put it out. Always start at the base of the fire. Um, this size here would just be good for a trash can, or like if you notice that couch fire right away, it would have worked then, but as soon as you notice that couch fire, you want to spray it out, but it's going to continue, couch fires will continue to smolder. Uh, mattress fires continue smaller. This isn't going to put it out. It's just going to delay it while your other person's on the phone call in the fire department say, my couch is on fire. And, uh, so, um, build a door with the back of your hand. Don't just come up to the door and grab the doorknob if you suspect your house is on fire because the doorknob's going to get metal. You're going to get hot. You can both sides and you're going to burn yourself. The door, metal doors or whatever, it can get really hot. Wood doors can get really hot. You don't want to burn your hand. You'd rather burn the back side of your hand than the front side of your hand. And don't just walk up and slap it right on the door. Approach it slowly. You only have to get close. If you feel any heat on that, if there's any heat at all, then you know there's a fire behind that door and you don't want to open it. Because right now, the fire could be under control for that room and it's using up the oxygen in that room. 
The second you open that door, it gets a mass rush of oxygen into that room. The oxygen is the number one fuel, creates a flashover, and like we saw in the video, when the, when the team came in to put the fire out, it flashed out the door, right? And going to take you out. Always know your escape route. Make sure you, you know how to get out of the house. Remember that challenge I told you all about earlier, blindfolding yourselves and having somebody watch and see if you can get out of your house because you saw how dark it got with the smoke. <coughs> and you use natural ventilation to clear the smoke. So, um, open the, like once the fire is out, then you're going to go open up the windows and the doors and, and turn on some fans the electrical system is not bad and has been cleared by the fire marshal. This is very toxic. So, uh, yeah. With so many... Uh, All the chemicals so in the house. Power, yeah, power chemicals, carpet or whatever. So are there any questions up to this point?